All right, so why should you listen to a random guy in a white t-shirt standing in front of a whiteboard? My name's Matt. I'm a current strategy and operations associate at Google. Prior to that, was a consultant at BCG. And I make these videos because I enjoy it, but also because I want to share with you what I've learned so that you can hopefully land your dream job. Today, we're going to talk about case interview math, and specifically, what kind of math is needed, some best practices when it comes to the case interview, and finally, some tips and tricks for doing the actual math in the interview. Let's get right into it. All right, so the first question we need to answer before we even think about math is, First of all, what kind of math is even needed? Right, because I think sometimes people get a little bit intimidated by the math, and the reality is that the math is not super complex. Basically, all you need to know is basic algebra and the ability to multiply and divide large numbers, as well as to deal with percentages. And so nothing you learned in calculus or linear algebra or any of those other advanced math classes if you're a math major is going to really apply to case interviews. So often when I explain this to people, I get a lot of comments about, oh, consulting math is so easy, like anyone can do it. And I would say that, yes, that's true. The math itself is not inherently that difficult and doesn't require you to have a PhD to complete. But what really matters is how you interpret the numbers and how you use them in the context of the case. And so for example, two people can come to the same exact number, but one person can explain it in a way that makes more sense than the other person and therefore do better in the interview. And so for example, if we learn that company A does 5 million in sales and we know the total market is 200 million, dollars, then an okay candidate might arrive at this number and say, okay, awesome. So I've learned that company A does 5 million in sales, and I think that that's a really big number. And so I would say that they're doing relatively well. However, a smarter candidate would take this number in the context of other data points, including this one, and say, well, okay, this is interesting. It looks like company A does about 5 million in sales per year. And so that's pretty good. But I can also see that the entire market is 200 million. So currently they have less than 1% of the entire market. And so that could mean a couple of things. It could mean that they have a lot of room to grow or it could mean that there is some other reason why they have such a small market share. Maybe they've just entered the market, for example. But if they've been around for a while, then maybe there's some sort of structural issue with their business. And so that's an example of why, even though the math might not be the most advanced, you're never being truly tested on just the accuracy of your calculations. You're also being tested on how you think about that number in relation to other data points given in the case. And that makes sense, right? Because any number or data point that you get is just one single discrete data point. And so it doesn't have as much meaning unless you compare it to a set of other data points. Like for example, if you tell me, hey Matt, I have $10 million. What should I do with it? Well, without additional information and additional data points on who you are and what stage of life you're at, and potentially what your goals are, then how can anyone give you a solid recommendation for what you should do with your money? Like obviously some people would be like, yeah, you should invest. Other people would be like, oh, you should spend it. Or some people would be like, oh, just like put it under your pillow. And none of these by themselves are inherently bad recommendations. They all have pros and cons, but they might not be the best recommendation for you because your specific situation, maybe you just happen to be like an 18 year old and you know, you're not from a wealthy background and you need the financial stability and you have low risk tolerance, etc. So all this is to say, we basically need to take the numbers not in isolation as discrete points, but we also need to really consider them in the context of other numbers in the case. But now that we know what kind of math is needed in most case interviews, the next question you might be having is why do I even need to be tested on this math? It seems very basic, right? And that's a valid question. And what I would say to that is nowadays, most people in business roles, whether it be consulting or other jobs in corporate, never actually do math by hand or mentally. They're always using some sort of tools or some sort of program, whether it be Excel or a calculator, to do the math. And so when you're actually working full time, you're rarely going to ever actually have to do mental math or quick math by hand. But despite that, the reason why consulting firms still test you in case interview math is because one, it gives them a sense of your quantitative aptitude. Can you think quickly and make estimates without needing to consult your financial model, for example? Like the bottom line is you have to be somewhat good at math. You don't need to be a genius, but you need to be somewhat good at, at basic math in order to do this job well. But the second piece is how this translates to on the job. And so there are a number of situations in consulting where you might need to make a quick calculation. And a common example that often comes up is in a client meeting. Now, oftentimes it's going to be your managing director who is running this meeting. But say, for example, the client shows them a set of data or shows them the results of 
some survey that they've just run. And you guys have never seen it before, but it's interesting. Your managing director might try to basically interpret that data and do some quick calculations to basically try and draw out some key insights that maybe the team will then go ahead and build out a more complex analysis later. Additionally, when you're a junior consultant on the job, you almost always want to be sanity checking your work after you do any sort of analysis. And this can just be a lot easier sometimes if you don't have to always whip out a calculator or use Excel to check something. And finally, I would just say that testing you on math in an interview is good at assessing your speed and your accuracy with numbers. Now, speed and accuracy is the name of the game when it comes to jobs like consulting or investment banking, because you're often under a very short timeline to get a lot of work done. And so you need to be obviously fast and able to produce a lot of output, but also there's no point in producing a lot of output if it's inaccurate. And so the math that is tested, although I would say it's not a perfect assessment of how someone will perform on the job, it is one proxy of how fast can you be and how accurate can you be in a high pressure situation. Okay, but now that we've established what kind of math is needed and why we are being tested on math, the next question is, when we are doing the math in case interviews, how should we do it? And the answer here is whenever you are in a case interview scenario, you always want to structure out the basically logic of the equation that you are then going to plug the inputs into after before you do any sort of math. Now, the reason that you don't want to do the math up front is because, first of all, best practices are that you should run the logic by your interviewer first to ensure that it makes sense to them and also to ensure that you're not making any mistakes because they can give you feedback if you are. And second is because the thought process itself is just as important, if not more important, than the actual execution of calculating those numbers themselves. In case interviews, you're not necessarily being tested on, oh, did he get to this exact number? It's more about the methodology and the process by which you got to that result. And so I would argue that demonstrating very clear thinking is just as important, if not more, than demonstrating that you can actually do the calculations. And so I've basically laid these three steps out here, but again, we gotta build the logic out first, and then we have to walk through it with the interviewer before we actually do the math. And the big thing here is we need to demonstrate clear thinking and also good communication. Many people underestimate this aspect of the case interview. By good communication, I'm talking about do you speak aloud and explain every step of your thought process in a logical, ordered way to your interviewer such that they can understand what you're talking about and they're not confused and having to ask clarifying questions. Do they understand exactly what you are going to do and how you are going to do it? And do they understand why you're doing it that way? And are you able to communicate that confidently and in a way that demonstrates to them that if you were to be dropped off in a client meeting, you wouldn't make a fool of yourself and you would be able to walk the CEO or whoever the client is through the work that you've been doing and the analysis that you've been building. That is what is also being tested at the same time that you are doing the quantitative portion of a case. The math itself is not supposed to be the difficult part. What you are being tested on is not just if you can get to the right number. It is also how you communicate it and how you structure your problem solving approach to demonstrate to the interviewer that you can come up with a repeatable methodology for solving these problems. But now with all that in mind, Let's talk about some actual tips and tricks that can be helpful when it comes to actually doing the math in a case interview scenario where you're not gonna have a lot of time, you're not gonna have access to a calculator, and you're gonna have the interview basically staring at you. And so you might be feeling more pressure than you would if you were just doing this math alone in a room. Now the first one is don't use zeros. Now this might come as not a surprise for some of you, but I'm just gonna say it because I'm assuming zero knowledge of case interviews here. And what I will say is you'll often get really, really large numbers in the millions or the billions of dollars or units. And so quick rule of thumb is you always wanna use abbreviations if you can, use billions, use millions, use you know K for thousands. Never, ever, ever write out the zeros because you are literally just going to waste time and also there's a lot of issues and errors that you can make if you have a ton of zeros on your paper. Just remember that billion is nine zeros, million is six zeros, K is three. And when you calculate large numbers, where maybe you're multiplying or dividing millions by billions, it's super important to keep track of how many zeros you need in your final result. And so for example, if we we're gonna do something like 40 million times 6,000, what we can do here is we can multiply the four and the six, which you know is 24, and then we know there's 10 zeros after it. So I'm just gonna do 
times 10 to the 10th, OK? And 10 to the 10th, which is also 240 billion. Now, another person might have written out all the 10 zeros after this, but again, that would be pretty time consuming. And if you just remember that a billion has nine zeros, then you'd know that, OK, 24 times 10 to the 10th, that's basically the same as 240 times 10 to the 9th which is a billion. And so that's how I know it's 240 billion. But just a simple example for you. Now, the second tip I have is round numbers where possible. Now, I think a lot of people already sort of know that you should be rounding numbers where possible. But I think another thing that can really help you take it to the next level is when you are rounding numbers and you're telling your interviewer, hey, for example, I want to take 32.5 and actually round it down to 30. What a OK candidate would say is, Oh, so I'm actually going to round down to 30 because that's a little bit easier to manage. Now, there's nothing wrong with that explanation. But if you want to take it a step further, what you should really do here is you should give some sort of reason why it makes sense to round down to 32 rather than just, oh, it's easier for the math. So a basic example of this would be, hey, maybe this 32.5 represents the number of people in a day that, on average, are entering a store. But you know that the store that you're currently evaluating is actually in a location where it's a little bit off of the, the main street, and there's slightly lower foot traffic. And so what you could say to your interviewer is, hey, so I know we've been given that 32.5 is the average number of people that typically enter this type of a store. but..." Given the additional information that we know about the store location, it's a little bit further from the main shopping street. I would imagine we should be a little bit more conservative and assume that there's less foot traffic going into this store on average. And so I think it makes sense to round down to 30 instead of using 32 and a half. That is an example of taking it one step further than just saying, oh, I'm going to round just because it's easier for the math. Instead, you give a legit reason based on the context of the case for why it makes sense for you to round up or to round down. Now, the third tip that I have for math is you should always break numbers apart. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, oftentimes you're going to be asked to do things like double digit multiplication or just multiplying numbers that aren't perfectly round. And so I want to show you a quick trick that can help you really simplify the math. And so, for example, if we have something like 55 times 60, we can break this out into basically 50 times 60 plus 5 times 60. And so we know that 50 times 60 is 3,000. And we know that 5 times 60 is 300. And so the answer is 3,300. And so you should always be looking for opportunities to break numbers apart in order to simplify the calculations for yourself and to avoid making unnecessary errors. Now, another pretty helpful tip for multiplying numbers is cross multiplication. And I'm going to start squatting here. So for example, if you have something like 31 times 12, one way that you could do this is you could do it the traditional way of multiplying it like this and having multiple steps. But there is a trick to make this a little bit quicker. And so the trick is that you first multiply the digits in the ones place to get the last digit. Then you multiply the digits in the tens place to get the first digit. And finally, for the middle, you have to cross multiply. So we're going to multiply these two digits, and we're going to add them together. And so 1 plus 6 is 7. So for example, 31 times 12 I know is 372 now because I did the cross multiplication trick. And so this is another pretty quick way to multiply double digit numbers together. That can be helpful sometimes in a case interview. But one other thing that I haven't discussed is how to deal with percentages. And so oftentimes in a case interview scenario, in addition to obviously having to multiply and divide large numbers with many digits, you're also going to have to do some sort of calculations with percentages. And so again, when you encounter percentages, the first thing you want to think about is, is there an opportunity for me to break the percentages apart such that it makes the calculation a little bit easier for me? Let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, that we need to calculate 15% of 60 million. Now, one way is you could do it the, the normal way and try to multiply 0.15 times 60 million. But how we can make this easier for ourselves is we can break 15% into 10% and 5%. And so this is actually 10% and 5%, right? And so if we can take 10% of 60 million and 5% of 60 million and then add those together, then that'll get us to the same result. And it's much easier to get 10% of any number, again, because we just have to remove a 0. And so we know that 10% of 60 is just 6. And 5% is just half of 10%, so we know that's 3. So then we know that. This is actually 9. And don't forget the, the millions. And so we were very easily able to get to 15% of 60 million by just breaking the 15% into just 10% and 5% and just adding those two together. Now, another way that this can work is if, say, for example, you need to do 35% of 80 million. right? Now, in this case, it's not as simple as breaking it into just 10% and 5%. But what we can remember is that 35%, that's basically 
times seven, right? And so if we can just get 5% of 80 million and then to multiply that number by seven, then we can also get to the result. And 5% is half of 10%. And so 10% of 80 is eight. Divide that by two, that's four. And so we know this is four times seven gets us 28. And don't forget again, to add the million. So we know that 35% of 80 million is 28 million. So again, always be looking for opportunities to break apart the percentages because it's gonna make your life so much easier when it comes to calculating X percent of some giant number. All right, so now that I've showed you some tricks, you might still be wondering, what do I do if I get stuck or if I get the wrong answer in a case interview? Now, the first thing is just stay calm, take a deep breath, and again, ask your interviewer for feedback. And if they say, for example, oh, maybe you should check your math again, or oh, I think there might be a better way to do this, then this is your cue that you should go back and check your math. And so the way I would do this is I would say, all right, so it looks like I've gotten to this, say, 65 million number, but let me take a moment now to double check my work. And so what I would do is I would then walk the interviewer through the entire logic of your equation again. And again, if they agree and still say, yeah, that sounds good to me, then the issue is probably not with how you structured the math, but it's with how you actually did the calculations. And so that's a good thing because then you can just go back and again, check your math and go through slowly, talk aloud, and again, tell them what you're doing, walk them through the process, say, hey, I'm taking 15% of 65 million and that gets me to X, and ideally, this should allow you to identify the problem where you went wrong. Now, some common issues that I see with math are people, again, they use too many zeros or they get messed up with the zeros and they, they leave one out or they add an additional zero in, which then increases or decreases your result by an order of magnitude. But sometimes people also make basic multiplication or division mistakes as well. And so honestly, don't stress. You're often much more nervous in a case interview than you are when you are preparing and say in your room or in the library. And so it's okay if you make some mistakes. Now that said, if you are currently in the thick of the case and grind and you think you might benefit from a little bit of help, I do offer one-on-one -on -one coaching where I can give you tailored personalized feedback and guide you through the process one-on-one. -on -one. If that sounds interesting to you, then just feel free to check out the link in the description. But otherwise, thanks for dropping by. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.